This is the 19th annual science research symposium. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of what we'll do today. So we'll start with a welcome. Um, then Mrs. Tarlow, who is our high school principal, will uh, say a few words of wisdom. Uh, then we'll have a keynote speaker who is Kevin Napier. Then we'll talk about our sophomores, uh, then our junior, our senior, and then we'll conclude at the end. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. Um, I know it's a little bit of a different year, so this is a little bit different than it normally is, but the nice thing is that we're actually together in a room this time. Uh, last year, everybody was at their house and um, we were trying to figure out what we were gonna do and how we were gonna get to present our research. We had six seniors and they were able to present theirs virtually, so that was nice. Um, so the first person I'd like to invite up is Mrs. Tarlow and she is our high school principal. Thank you, Mr. Klotzko, I appreciate it. If I was gonna share words of wisdom tonight, I insisted on the Death Star as my background or I didn't feel like I could, I could share too much. But um, first, I wanna thank you all for inviting me to this great event. Um, I wanna congratulate all of our young scholars that are here this evening on presenting the culmination of your hard work, your inquiry and your research. It's really exciting. Uh, and I want to acknowledge and thank Mr. Klosko for his guidance and leadership of these young adults and showing them what the journey of research looks like and for making this symposium a priority this year, despite the challenges that, that were ahead of us. So thank you, everybody. Uh, renowned, I'll keep it short, I'll keep it sweet, uh, but I found this quote and I thought it was appropriate for, for tonight. Uh, renowned poet William Butler Yeats told us that education is not the filling of a pail, but rather the lighting of a fire. And I loved that. And I truly thought that that was appropriate for tonight. And I hope that that journey of lifelong learning um, stays ignited in you and that you always seek information and knowledge and truth in your lives. And so I, I think this is a great beginning, not an end of, of what it looks like to, to be a lifelong learner. So I think you can take some of these um, teachings with you uh, be proud of yourselves for your efforts and your exploration. Be proud of challenging yourselves to take on this college level work at high school um, and that it's hopefully taught you proper ways of research. Um, I'm sure you're going to hear the words reliability and validity in the back of your minds for quite some time now. So uh, congratulations to all of you. I am very proud and, and honored to have been invited tonight. Thank you, Mr. Fosco. Congratulations, everybody. Next, I am introducing Mr. Klosko back to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tarlow. Um, so this year, um, Kev, I went back and I found some sweet pictures of you from when you were back at high school. And um, I, I have the distinct pleasure of being able to introduce Kevin Napier, who um, was a student of mine um, in earth science when he was a freshman, and he is still to this day, the only one to have gotten a 99 on the earth science regents exam. Um, no one has gotten 100, so he still has the highest grade ever at Cohoes High School that I know of, um, and I've been here for 15 years. So I grabbed a couple pictures of him um, because he was a pretty good baseball player, and every time I talk to him, I still tell him, I can't believe I made you suicide squeeze with two strikes um, at uh, Ravina but he put it down great and we actually won the game because of it. So um, thank you, Kevin, for making me look like I knew what I was doing when I was coaching. Um, but Kevin is a high school graduate uh, from Coes, and then he went on to Siena where he got his, um, his bachelor's in um, both physics and in mathematics. And then he went on to get a master's degree from the University of Michigan. And then he is currently a PhD student um, candidate at the University of Michigan. So he's going to be our keynote speaker. It's just going to take me just a second to get it queued up so that um, he can take over and do his presentation. So just bear with me for a second, please. Okay, Kevin, you should be all set now. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you. 
Okay, great. Mute so nobody can hear us. Well, thank you for selecting me as the keynote. It's an honor to be here, and I can't believe that it's been seven years. And it's great to be back, even if it is just over Zoom. So today I'll talk to you about one of the aspects of the research that I'm doing for my PhD. And it can get pretty complicated, but it can also be pretty simple. So in essence, we are just looking for rocks really far away in the solar system. So like 30 to 100 times farther away than the sun. So as a brief overview, in case anybody has forgotten or doesn't know, this is the, a picture of our solar system. I drew each of these myself. Uh, so we have the sun, and then we have the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then we have the asteroid belt, and then we have the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. And then we have the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. And beyond Neptune, for a very long time, for about 50 years, people only knew about Pluto. But then in 1992, um, some scientists discovered another thing out there. And since then, the, the field has really skyrocketed. So that region beyond Neptune is now called the Kuiper Belt, named after one of the scientists who predicted its existence. And there are about 3,000 known objects in the Kuiper Belt today. Um, so on the left is a top-down view of that census, and on the right is an edge-on view. So um, out this ring is basically Neptune, and then there's a lot of stuff out beyond Neptune. So we, we look for these things because, well, it seems kind of like an arbitrary thing to do, and I'll grant that in some ways it is, but in some ways there's also an intellectual curiosity that we're satisfying by finding these things. So they're excellent markers of how our solar system formed. So we can use the bulk properties of the system to figure out what our solar system must have been like in the past, kind of like playing CSI solar system. And that's important because we want to know how common solar systems like ours are in the universe and what does this mean for life elsewhere. Um, another important aspect of this work is that the techniques that we use to discover these objects, you know, these are rocks that are maybe the size of Cohoes at 30 astronomical units or 30 times the distance from the sun. And they're really hard to find, so it takes a lot of technology to do that. And by advancing the technology to find them, we are helping to advance the technology that we use for detecting and mitigating asteroid threats to Earth. So how do you find these rocks in space? Well, you need a big telescope. So this picture on the left is a, a four meter telescope. That means that the, the mirror of the telescope is like 12 or 13 feet across. And this is me on the right for scale. And this telescope is the one that we actually do use, my group, and it's in Chile. So the classical approach to finding these things is to take a few pictures of the sky, take one at midnight and then one at 1 a.m. and then one at 2 a.m. And then you blink between those pictures. And the idea is that the stars and the galaxies and everything are so far away that when you have the pictures lined up, they will all stay in the same spot. But things that are closer to us, things that are in our own solar system, will have their apparent position change due to parallax. So like you probably learned in ninth grade, um, if you stick your thumb out of arm's length and close one eye and then the other, it looks like your thumb is moving. And so in that instance, you, the rock is your thumb and your eyes are the earth, right? So the earth is switching spots and it looks like the rock is moving. So this is an illustration. So you can see that this green circle is tracking along with an asteroid. Um, and asteroids are really easy to find but things that are farther away are harder to find, and so they require a little bit more advanced techniques, but the underlying principle is all the same. So we have a group of people that are dedicated to finding these, and this is my group at Michigan. Um, so there are five undergrads, so certainly when you go to college, uh, try to get undergrad research because it's a great thing to have on your resume, and um, it really helps you when you are trying to go to grad school. So the strategy for this survey is that we point at very small spots in the sky and take a lot of pictures. So this is the whole sky, this ellipse, and then the black dots are the parts that we've looked at. So really very small spots on the sky. And that, so we take 100 pictures at one spot in the sky, 
and then we try to line them up at the moving rate of objects. But a priori, you do not know how fast these objects are moving on the sky. So you need to try all sorts of different combinations. And here you can see that as we shift all those images to this to different speeds, um, these are two transneptunian objects, Kuiper belt objects that are coming into focus. And you can see when they're at the wrong speed, they're not quite bright. And then once they get to a good speed, they, they look pretty round. So this is um, another illustration of, of that effect. So we have 100 pictures. And in each of those 100 pictures, you cannot see the object. It's too faint. So then you shift and stack them. And so with five images, you can maybe see a hint that there's something in the frame. 10 images is becoming a little bit more clear. 25, you could say, okay, there's definitely something round there. And with 100 images, it's it's like a signal beam, right? It's really, really bright and obvious. Um, and here you can see that these images have been lined up. So you, you kind of stack them like, like you could take a deck of cards and smush it to the side. Um, but the problem is that there are, in each of these speeds that we try, right, because there are a, an infinite number of possible speeds that these objects could be moving on the sky, um, there are about 100,000 sources per speed, and then we try 100 different speeds. So that means that we have 10 million candidates um, per night to look at, and that's too many for any person to look at. So this is where machine learning comes into play. So we start off with tens of millions of candidates for things that could be rocks in space. And then I wrote a machine learning code um, called the convolutional neural net, and I trained it with, by showing it pictures that I said, okay, this is junk and this is good. And it learned the features of good images. And so you throw in the millions of things and it spits out thousands of candidates after. So this looks pretty round, this looks round. So these, and then sometimes you get Things that just are obvious junk like this um, that we just want to reject without ever having to look at. So that's how we trim this big pile of garbage and pull the diamonds out of it. And then we have to somehow refine that step, right? Because these objects can be moving at an infinite number of different speeds, but we can't try, we can't try an infinite number of different speeds for shifting and stacking because it would take forever for the computer to do. So we then do the statistical technique called the Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, but, and so it's complicated, but you should read about it because it's very important for doing your um, uncertainty analysis on your data. But the point is that in this ice cream cone shape over here, that's all the possible speeds and you walk around with a, a weighted random walk in that parameter space and as your signal to noise, if your detection increases, um, you take that as your detection, right? So you walk around until you are no longer getting higher signal to noise. And then good objects have this characteristic pattern um, where it, it looks like a circle in the middle and then you're branching out to the edges. Um, so that's how we identify good objects in our sample. And then then we upload them to a website and humans have to look at them and stuff. But so I think that's about the end of my time. But so the next steps after this are you need to find objects on multiple nights and then link them together to compute their orbits. And then once you understand what kind of an orbit that object is on, you can use it to study the dynamical properties of the solar system. Um, so some essential skills that you'll need if, if you want to do something like this are um, programming is the, the number one most essential skill, but you also need to know how to do the math. Um, and really up through linear algebra, calculus and trigonometry, I use every day. And then technical writing so that you can explain to other people what you have done and they will know how to replicate it. And I think that's that's all I have. I think I'm out of time. I think you're muted. I was. Does anybody have any questions for Kevin? Any students here have any questions for Kevin? Or anybody else?
Okay, so we'll continue on with our program. Let me get this set up. Um, so, let's see. So the first thing that um, we're gonna uh, go to is normally if this was a, a uh, normal year, then we would have, every student would have a poster presentation and they would be able to go out into our hallway. We have that nice big room that's kind of between the new gym and um, the offices. And we set that up with tables and we have, every student will have a poster presentation. Um, this year we couldn't do that. So what we did was um, our sophomores pre-recorded a video about what, they are doing how they got started um, and kind of where they are in their research and they talk a little bit about that so i'm going to play that video now it's there are four different um sophomores that we have following that video if anybody has any questions you are more than welcome to ask any questions and um, the specific students will then if you um, direct it to one of them they will come up um, and they will answer that question right here in front of the death star as well so let me just get that set up here I'm a sophomore at Coos High School, and I'm a member of the Science Research class in the University at Albany. The topic I've been researching is the effect of physical activity on stress. I'm interested in this topic because I enjoy exercising, and I was curious to see if this benefits and helps your mental health. When I began researching a topic, I was looking at the difference between males and females in physical activity. As I went on with this topic, I found it difficult to decide if I should look into more strength and weight training or cardiovascular fitness, but as, as, as I was reading different articles on this topic, I came across the inclusion of testing stress, and I really enjoyed this article and decided I want to continue on this path and keep looking at stress. I have narrowed down my topic to the effect of physical activity on stress, and I am reading different journal articles on this topic to see the studies that have been completed in the area. I have just recently emailed different researchers that are studying this topic, and I have been in contact with Dr. Matthew stoltz Kolomanen from Columbia University, and he has answered some of my questions regarding his different articles that he has completed. In the future, I plan on getting a mentor who is knowledgeable on this topic and can help me with completing my research project. And for this project, I plan on testing physical activity and stress along with other factors on a high school population to see if there's any correlation. I'm also interested in getting feedback from the students to see if the physical activity has made them more motivated and boosted their self-esteem. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashna Aguma and I am a sophomore attending Tahoe High School. Right now I'm in science research and I'm doing a topic on social anxiety disorder. This year has been a wonderful experience because there is no other classes I get to do what I want and I am very thankful for that chance. As I mentioned, I am doing my topic on social anxiety disorder, but I have no specific part of social anxiety disorder I want to pursue. And that's my next step to moving forward. Um, Social anxiety disorder is important to the world because there's not many people that knows about it. And we should we need more awareness because not many people know it's a disorder. And I mostly pursued that topic because I felt like I had social anxiety disorder and I wanted to know more about it and to learn from it. I'm in Joseph McCormick, and this is my research history. So my background, my name is Joseph McCormick. I'm 16, I'm a sophomore in high school. And this is my first year in science research. My past research, I've looked at mental health in the whole, and I'm trying to whittle that down to smaller topics so that I can focus on a certain thing. Currently, I'm looking at mental health and surrounding stimuli. Surrounding stimuli means colors of walls, amount of windows and decorations on walls. 
and looking at how that affects a person's mental health. My future research, I wish to go deeper into psychology and surrounding stimuli and mental states and learning styles. Thank you. This is my presentation. Hi, I'm Amanda Okonka, and my topic is criminal psychology. This is a program science research, and this is my software here. I am a sophomore at Cohoes High School. This is my first year part of the program science research at the University of Albany. My topic is criminal psychology, which is the thoughts, behaviors, actions, and views of a criminal. And my interest in this topic is because I find it fascinating on how we as humans are all scientifically the same, but something in the brain creates them to be different and do harm to others or things. The importance in society is that it opens people's eyes to recognize that they have a mental disorder or something wrong with them mentally, and it just they don't just do these things out of spite. Where I'm at. Right now, I'm doing journal articles such as Sex Differences and Serial Killers by Marissa A. Harrison and others. And I'm also emailing possible mentors such as Noah C. Venables, who's at the University of Minnesota. And he emailed me back, and I got a couple of journal articles from him, which I will be reading. Also, Christopher J. Patrick, who I emailed, and I will be reaching out to him shortly. Where I am going, I'm looking for a possible mentor. So after I keep reading, I'm looking for them to possibly mentor me. I'm also looking down to narrow down my topic. So that would mean me diving into my journal articles a bit more and finding a topic that interests me and I would like to do more research into. Thank you for listening. Okay, so those are our sophomores. Does anybody have any questions for our sophomores? I'm just gonna give it a minute. Okay, so we'll move on to our junior. Um, I'll pull up uh, her project. Just give me one second, please. Uh, following this, if you have any questions for Sarah, please feel free to ask them. You can type them right in the chat, um, and then we can we can read the chat. Um, and she will come up to the front and um, speak. So set. Okay. Hello, my name is Sarah Tachi, and today I will be presenting my proposal on the effect of structured physical activity on cardiovascular conditioning in high school students with the help of my mentor, Dr. Torosov. Within sports, many, many people have shown benefits from exercise mentally and physically. Sprint interval training is just one of the type of exercises where benefits were shown within cardiovascular development in a particular study with obese and overweight women. The different workloads of polyometric exercise also would help with blood flow and blood pressure as well. It would also cause many other benefits in multiple different factors. Many different exercises have benefits in helping with diseases such as arrhythmia and also other systems in the body such as the renal system. The main purpose of the study was to investigate whether the sports provided by the high school as an extracurricular activity does have a measurable effect on cardiovascular conditioning within students. The two main objective objectives for the study was to examine how the high school sports will affect conditioning within high school students and determine whether these 
impacts differ based on the frequency of exercise or the duration of exercise. We hypothesize that participation in sports provided by the high school improves cardiovascular conditioning, and most of these effects will be more pronounced or more shown in students who exercise more often. An anonymous ID was, will be given to each participant in order to record data, and this, per, this ID will be given to them through their permission slip, and that's how the participants will be gathered. The athletes that will be involved in this experiment will be athletes from 2019 and 2020 due to COVID restrictions at the time, not having any sports. The questionnaire will be provided in order to get demographic information for each participant. Here is some of the examples of the questions for the questionnaire, which include asking what grade they're in, whether they were in a sport during 2019 to 2020, and if they were involved in any consistent physical activity in the past six weeks. The cardiovascular conditioning will be investigated by measuring the heart rate at rest and after breath holding for a short period of time. And then heart rate will be measured again right after exercise and will be again measured three minutes after exercise for both the athletic and non-athletic group. Pulse oximeters will be used in order to record the data for heart rate and the YMCA three minute step test will be the exercise used in this particular study in order to gather the information and it extended to 10 minutes. The results recorded will be put down in data tables and graphs. COVID-19 restrictions and regulations will be included such as being six feet apart and wearing masks. Here's the data table for the results in which the anonymous ID would go and indicate which group each ID is a part of, and all the results will go in their respective forms. The baseline heart rate graph is how this would look like, and it would be for the first trial, second trial, and third trial for both the non-athletic and athletic group, and it will be recorded in beats per minute. Post-peak exercise heart rate will also be recorded in beats per minute, and for the non-athletic and athletic group for the first, second, and third trial. And heart rate three minutes post-exercise will also be recorded within a graph for beats per minute before and during the second and third trial for both in the non-athletic and athletic group. The differences will be the differences of the means will be compared with a t test, and it is expected there to be 20 control and 20 experimental subjects in each group. With this, the true difference is estimated to be around negative point negative 5.263 or 5.263 BPM, which is beats per minute, with a probability of nine. According to a previous study that measured their heart rate, they a true standard deviation difference of five beats per minute. We expect to have a measurable impact on cardiovascular conditioning and students that participated in sports specifically will have this measurable impact and they will, it will show that they have a lower baseline and breath holding heart rate and it will be a positive correlation between the two. Thank you for listening and are there any questions? Okay, so that is Sarah's. Does anyone have any questions for her? Let me see, I got something here. Oh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nolan just says, it's not a question, but he wanted to state how great it is to see sophomores in the program having multiple years and the program is really great um, and a key attribute of one of the reasons he was able to get into NYU. Does <clears throat> anybody have any questions for Sarah? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so there will probably be, be some sort of a systematic from people being nervous when you're taking their heart rate, their resting heart rate that will drive it up. 
do you have a way that you're planning to mitigate that such as taking it multiple times or yeah we're doing like three trials for this due to that fact in order to originally we were planning to do three different trials because of the athletic group we're going to follow one group but due to COVID restrictions, we were not able to do that since the forming of this proposal. We didn't have sports available at the time. So we're going to be doing three trials for each athletic and non athletic group. And that is how we are planning to mitigate that. Anybody have any other questions? Yep, uh, Ms. Frost, are you researching this for possible medical school? Um, well, I do plan to go to medical school. This would be useful as I am researching articles within the ca cardiovascular field and how the conditioning of car the cardiovascular system does uh, effect is affected through exercise and yeah so yeah and then um mr nolan said i may have missed it but how are you defining athletics certain sports are more intense than others so i tended i intended to include any sport with anyone within a sport so there wasn't really a def like a definite thing between each sport it would just be all sports uh, everyone on the questionnaire would put whether they did sports or not. And since during this time, like I said, COVID, we didn't have sports available. I said I included the question on whether they were active frequently during a six week period. Um, because if they are not active for six weeks, then their heart rate tends to return to how it was before they were doing exercise. And that is what I am currently doing with that. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, so we'll move on to our um, our senior. You just give me a second. Pull that up. Um. Following Jennifer's, um, please feel free to ask any questions. Hello, my name is Jennifer Martinez Perez, and my project is racial and ethnic discrimination on an online and offline setting and the effects on teenagers. I did this project with the help of Dr. Casey P. Jacobowski, who is a chair in the Little Arts and General Studies Department at the Valley Community College. Online and offline racial discrimination is an action created by people to cause harmful or unfair treatment towards people and or groups based on their race. For this study, online discrimination will be referred to as social media, text messages, and or other online and technology G settings. While the term offline discrimination will be referred to as in person discriminatory actions, racial discrimination in either form is extremely damaging towards adolescents. However, research has shown that online discrimination creates higher levels of poor mental health compared to offline discrimination due to how hard it is to escape from it and how constant it is. Both online and offline racial discrimination 
can cause adolescents to have psychological distress, depression, stress, anxiety, PTSD, and low self-esteem. The purpose of this study is to examine the effects of online and in-person racial discrimination. More specifically on how this perceived discrimination affects teenagers. This study will specifically look into how these perceived factors are related to symptoms of anxiety, depression, and negative coping mechanisms that adolescents use. No clinical diagnosis will occur, only the perceptions of stressors will be examined. The overall goal of this study is to identify perceptions of discrimination to help create a better and healthier environment for students. This study will examine the severity of perceived race ethnicity and offline discrimination, the severity of perceived race ethnicity and online discrimination, the relationships between perceived online discrimination and these symptoms of anxiety and depression, the perceived relationships between offline discrimination and the symptoms of anxiety and depression, and how the person acts following these perceived offline and online discrimination. These specific examinations will help me find out the population that examines online and offline discrimination, and if it correlates with perceived symptoms of anxiety and or depression. It will also help me figure out if there are high percentages of both areas and if it makes people want to act a certain way to prevent those actions. For the study, participants will be from close middle school and high school. Any students from the grades 7 through 12 will be able to participate through the use of a permission slip. Permission slips will be handed out to students in their classes with the help of several teachers at both high school and middle school levels. Once a student has signed the permission slip, they will be able to, to complete the study. Permission slips will be individually coded to keep participants anonymous. A master code list of codes will be kept by Mr. Michael Clasco for any student who forgets their code. The questionnaire, the questionnaire will be completed through the use of Google Forms. The instructions will be provided both verbally and textually as an introduction to the Google Forms. The survey will be administered online and should take approximately 30 minutes to complete. The survey will also include definitions for complex words. All of these scales are Likert scales and specifically look for certain things. The online victimization scale will look into online discrimination. The everyday discrimination scale will look for in-person discrimination and the coping with discrimination will look into how a person copes with discrimination. These specific scales are scales that the participant have to play what applies to them. The chronic work discrimination had slight modifications to fit the school environment. This specific scale will look into whether or not their experiences with discrimination is associated with their peers in class. The heightened diligence scale will look into how the participant feels about getting discrimination and what they do to prevent it. The last two scales will look into how whether or not the discrimination is associated with anxiety and or depression. And although will be used to analyze the amount of online and offline discrimination racial groups experience. It will also be used to analyze if there is a correlation between online and offline discrimination and anxiety and depression. This scale will specifically look for if there are any coping strategies and if the participant feels the need to act a certain way to combat online and offline discrimination. It is believed that this study will find that students of color will experience higher levels of perceived online and offline discrimination, which in result causes the POC students to have higher levels of perceived symptoms of depression and anxiety compared to their white classmates. This study might also find that online discrimination can cause POC adolescents to have received symptoms of higher anxiety and depression compared to offline discrimination. 
through the coping with discrimination in heightened village and scale, it will also show that POC students could also feel the need to act a certain way to prevent discrimination. The next couple of slides will be my work cited page. Thank you for coming and are there any questions? Okay, does anybody have any questions for Jeff? Sure. I have a very small window that I'm working with. Okay, so uh, Mr. Nolan says, because I work in games that are often online and have large communities, this is a very interesting topic. If you come across any research specific to games or or that you think is applicable, applicable, he would love to see it. And he would also love to see your data when you're done. All right. Thank you. Um, Does anybody else have any um, questions? Okay, we'll move on um, to the end of our, of our um, little symposium here. Just give me one second, please. So um, that's kind of uh, the meat of the presentation. I always like to kind of conclude a little bit. And there's a couple of things I always like to mention when we talk about this um, and when we do science research. And I usually do it in the beginning, but um, I feel like I'm a little off from this being kind of like this. It's a little weird. But for anyone that isn't aware, science research is a three-year program um, and students start as sophomores. So some of these students um, will have the pleasure of having me for four years. Um, which is uh, something that um, might be a little bit uh, taxing for some of them, um, but they do a great job. So a couple of years ago, uh, I had a group of students who started as juniors working me to uh, give them something so that they could have like display it at graduation. Um, and I started giving out certificates, which I don't have a certificate for Jen tonight because um, to be quite honest, I had to bring them home when COVID hit, and I'm not sure where they are, um, the papers that I use for that. So I, I brought them home because I had to make the certificates. And last year, if anybody um, got to see symposium, I email I emailed all the parents because everybody was at home and I sent all the certificates. So I had to do them all at the house, my house, and then I mailed them or dropped them off at all of the houses of the students, the six seniors. So during symposium, um, the parents actually gave them the uh, certificate and the medal that they get every year. Um, but the certificate, I guess, wasn't wasn't quite enough, so they worked on me for a little bit more. So um, several years ago, I started um, getting uh, medals, and the medal it's just um, just has like an atom on it. I, mean, I don't know how well it shows up. Probably not great, but let's see if I can get it even closer. So there you go. So there's the. It's got like a, a, just like an atom on it. It's got our school colors as a lanyard. Um, and then it says an honor of science research on the back. And uh, when I found out that I was gonna be able to do this, I went down to uh, then principal, uh, Mr. Wood. And I said, um, we don't have a lot of students that go through this program and it's a, a pretty intense program. Students are reading journal articles um, as sophomores, which 
Um, anybody that's gone to college knows that's one of the first things that you, when you get to college, you've got to learn how to read a peer reviewed journal article. Um, and everyone in this room with me right now is already versed, well versed in that. Um, they know how super fun it is and, and how challenged it is to, to read one of those. So uh, when they get to college, they're gonna be better off. And that's one of the things I always hear uh, from science research students when they come back. Um, this year is a little different because we almost always have uh, previous science research students in the room with us. Um, it's a pretty tight knit group. Um, Mr. Nolan was a science research student as well. So I'm sure he understands that, that um, when you're in science research, you, you feel for the other people and, and you're kind of like a little family. So um, I asked him if there was any way they could wear them at graduation. And he said, let me think about it. Um, uh, so then uh, the day of symposium, he hadn't given me an answer yet. So I said, hey, Mr. Wood, you remember when I asked you about um, students wearing them? Do you think they could right in front of everybody? And he was kind of forced to say yes. So now they're allowed to wear them. Um, so at graduation, um, Jen gets to wear this um, and kind of wear it with some pride because she got to go through the science research process. And I'll, I'll give that to her um, in, in just a minute uh, when, I'm, when I'm done speaking. But uh, this, is, this is a day that I always get a lot of great job, Mr. Klotzko, you're a great job. It looks great, it's awesome. And, and I try to always say, and unfortunately, um, they won't get to hear this, um, but I try to make it very vocal whenever someone says that. And, and I always try to say, it's, it's not about me, it's about them. Uh, because they put the work in and, and, and I expect a lot out of them. Um, I will be the first one to know that, first one to tell you that, that I expect more than they think that they're capable of doing. Um, and they somehow always rise to that bar and make sure that they clear it. And that's a kudos to them. Um, but I do need to thank some other people while we're here. Um, first of all, I need to thank all the administrators at Caholi because there isn't a time and it doesn't matter who the administrator was. Um, I've been here for three principals now and uh, it didn't matter if it was Mr. Rajak, uh, Mr. Wood or now Mrs. Tarlow. And it doesn't matter who the superintendent was um, or assistant superintendent. Every time that I needed something for science research, um, they always asked, how could we do it? Not, um, that's too much to ask because you have a small class. It's always, uh, how can we make sure that the kids have what they need to be successful? Um, the next people are the Board of Education. I've had numerous um, people on the Board of Education that I've had the pleasure of being able to have um, conversations with in and outside of school. And they are always very supportive and always make sure that they um, let me know if there's anything that I need for science research to let them know. Um, we have teachers in the building that I can take any proposal to and I can say, hey, can you read this? Um, because I might not be the best person to read that since my background is geology. I'm really good with rocks and minerals and I'm really good with streams and glaciers. But once you get out of that wheelhouse, um, I'm not I'm not so good at it. So um, I like to rely on them and they always step up. And there are and I know there are teachers um, here in um, the the room, I guess we can call it the virtual room. I don't know what we call it, but in the in this WebEx there, they're here watching right now because they want to see um, what these students do. And they'll ask me how it went. Um, they're friends because I can guarantee that their friends at some point have heard about this class and um, have probably said to them, I don't understand why you're taking that class. Um, but more often than not have said things like, you know, you're, you can do this, you know, you wanted to take this class, you can do this, so they're a support. Um, and the final thing that I, people that I always like to thank um, is I always like to thank the families because um, I remember what I was like when I was in high school um, and, you know, talking to everyone here, you know, they're, they want to they wanna spread their wings and they want to fly, uh, but they need help to do that and they don't always tell their families thank you. So I always like to make sure I take the opportunity to say thank you to the families because without you, they wouldn't be here um, and they should say thank you way more than they do. So I just want to make sure that I say thank you because I'm sure there have been times where they have um, talked to you about science research, especially like the first time that they read a journal article um, or the first few times they read a journal article. That's that's not an easy task. Um, and these guys all did it um, in a great way. So I just want to say make sure I say thank you to the families as well. Um, Normally at this time, I would say, thank you for coming. Um, let's go out and let's have some snacks and let's look at everybody's posters. But apparent, uh, 
um, unfortunately that there is no real um, posters or anything. And unfortunate for me, there are no snacks because I love snacks. So uh, if anybody has any uh, like last minute comments, I can see stuff popping up on my um, laptop, but I can't see what it is because um, my, eyes, my eyes are not as good as they used to be and it's pretty far away. Uh, so I'm gonna check that real quick. And if there's anything um, that I just need to respond to really quick, I will. If not, I will let all of you guys go. And I just wanna thank you guys for coming. Um, and it was, it's been a pleasure to have everybody in the same room. I really like having everybody together. Um, I was very sad when we couldn't do that last year. So let me just check that real quick. Okay, um, so with that, I will let everybody go. Kevin, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, it has been a pleasure to catch up with you and talk with you a couple times. I know I got to catch up with you um, with a couple more things, but um, I, I love to see how well you guys are doing and, and see how old students are, are doing and what they're up to, especially when it's cool stuff like astrophysics, because not a lot of people get to go into that. So thank you very much. Thank you, yeah, I was glad to do it and always happy to, to come talk. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I will see, hopefully see everybody at some point very soon. Thanks. Have a great night.